The article discusses a project by Boston Globe criminal justice reporter Ivy Scott, where she interviews couples in Massachusetts where one member is currently or has been incarcerated. The project explores the challenges and resilience of love in the prison system, including the impact of surveillance on relationships. Incarcerated. Incarcerated. Resilience. Resilience. Intimacy. Intimacy. Surveillance. Surveillance. Hurdles. Hurdles. Background check. Background check. WBUR Podcasts. Boston. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and you're listening to The Common. Boston Globe criminal justice reporter Ivy Scott, welcome to The Common. Thanks so much for having me. Ivy, you spent months talking with couples where one member was or is currently incarcerated with a life sentence in Massachusetts. And you did this for a project under the Boston Globe's Love Letters podcast. Tell us more about this project and what you were hoping to discover through it. Yeah, of course. So I came to this project sort of with one big central question, which was taking a look at what the system does to love. I became really fascinated with the resilience of relationships and and just looking at what it takes to make love work in an environment that is is very hostile to love and intimacy. Mm. And I also learned a lot about and became very interested in just the different elements of the system that make love difficult for people. And I think the other thing that really struck me as I was doing this reporting was the idea of the long arm of the justice system and the way that incarceration impacts not only people who are incarcerated themselves, but also everybody connected to somebody in prison. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's start with the three couples you met. Tell me about them. Yeah. So uh, the first, Charlene and Blake, they met through a mutual friend um, while Blake was serving time for second degree murder. They got engaged and married while Blake was in prison. Um, and then when he was released, uh, the two of them began navigating their life together on the outside. Then we have Venus and Cornelius. And Cornelius is still, for the entire duration of their relationship, which is going on six years now, is still incarcerated. And so they continue to face some of the hurdles of incarceration through their engagement. And they hope Mm. to get married if and when he's released. And then our last couple, Leanne and Jesus, certainly the most tumultuous of the three. Uh, Leanne lives in the UK and met Jesus through a prison pen pal program on Facebook and wasn't expecting to fall in love, wasn't expecting anything serious to come of this, but nevertheless found herself in love and and dated this man for, for a little over two years. Okay, now, this series looks at several aspects of the prison system that can make it tough for relationships to thrive. And surveillance is one example. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So in what I'm sure is not a surprise to anyone, the prison system is full of surveillance. What's interesting, though, is is the ways that those different elements of surveillance impact relationship and people's ability to connect. So, for example, we'll take a look at like phone calls. Every single time that uh, you receive a phone call from an inmate, um, it always starts with a message. The message reminds you that the phone call is going to be recorded, that it might be being monitored live. The limit is uh, 20 minutes. And those calls are also always outgoing only. And so it's just interesting to see even the ways that these couples sort of adapt, like these women have their phones really at the ready because they don't want to miss that call. If they miss that call, they don't know when they're going to get another one. And when they are on the phone, you know, they try to be mindful of the ways that they talk, what they talk about. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, you talk about 
in-person visits. There is a background check. There are multiple security checkpoints. There's like a long list of rules on what you can and can't wear into the prison, like ways that you can and cannot behave. Like even in the visiting room, for example, the extent to which they're able to touch, how long they can hug, whether they can kiss, like all of the things that are are sort of part and parcel of intimacy and of the deepening of relationship for people um, on the outside. All of those things are sort of called into question because of the surveillance and the security factor. Yeah, I was listening to uh, the episode with Cornelius in Venus. Cornelius was voicing some of his frustrations with this is a person who you are in love with. And of course, you want to express that physically. Right. But you get you only get so much. The rough part about it is the limited amount of touching you can do and the fact that when they say fit is over, you're going separate ways. You know what I mean? So you never get used to that because you want to leave. You, know, you don't want to walk this way. You want to go that way. That sounded excruciating, you know? Yeah, no, I think it is. It's a challenge that they learn to live with. So that's one particular issue that specifically relates to when the partner is incarcerated inside of the facility. Your first episode, uh, you spoke with a couple, Charlene and Blake. Um, They were the first couple you profiled, and Blake is actually out on parole now. Talk about um, what their relationship dynamic looked like in light of Blake's parole. Yeah, I think, honestly, in a way that's uh, a little different, but has some notable similarities to navigating the confines of relationship from behind the wall. There is a way in which those confines follow you, even even when you get out. And so being on parole, there's certain things that uh, Blake can and cannot do that don't just affect his life. They also affect the life of his family. And so, for example, you need to get permission from your parole officer if you want to travel out of state. And I believe it's something like it's about a month ahead of time. And so if Blake wants to take his wife away for Mother's Day on a vacation, um, if he wants to celebrate her birthday by going up to New Hampshire, they need permission to do that. And just even the idea that, um, you know, there's these monthly check-ins by the parole officer and every single time there's a new parole officer, the parole officer, as Charlene describes it, sort of treats Blake as if he just got out yesterday. And so it's this long litany of questions, like, does he understand what the requirements are? And, you know, in this couple's mind, they're like, of course, like, we've, we've been doing this for years now. Like, we're very yeah. familiar with the restrictions. We're very familiar with the limitations. And yet being treated like this is all very new to them, I think only adds to their frustration. Yeah, I remember Blake saying, when is enough going to be enough? I mean, how long should I have to be on parole before they say, okay, you did something in your 20s, now you're in your 60s, and you're still on parole? It's always been like that, waiting for the other shoe to drop or, you know, waiting for them to implement some new stipulation or threaten him with something or... So that's the pressure we've learned, I guess, to live under. This is something that uh, appears in in the Prince story, um, but not in the uh, podcast episode is, you know, we, you hear in the podcast episode that Blake um, has been diagnosed with cancer. Um, But Mm. even the way that those parole requirements continue to follow him as he is now really like in a very fragile place in life. And Charlene tells this like, really haunting story about how the morning of his surgery to try and remove some of this cancer, they had like a a, a scram box for him. It's like a a box that you blow in to test whether or not you have any alcohol in your blood. He Mm -hmm. was too weak. He could not blow into the box. And um, just the idea that now she's trying to worry about, like she's trying to figure out, is this going to be a parole violation? Like, how do I explain to the parole officer that he's not trying to violate this? He just literally is not physically strong enough. I think it just sort of points to the rigidity of the system um and you know the fact that there are a lot of hurdles to accessing flexibility we're going to take a break but we'll be right back
And we're back with more from Ivy Scott of the Boston Globe. Is there anything being done to bring some ease to these relationships here in Massachusetts? Yeah, there are a few policies in the works um, that are sort of actively unfolding. The one that comes most immediately to mind because it is upcoming is that free phone calls for inmates at both the county jails and the state prisons will begin on December 1st. There is also a state rep, uh, Russell Holmes, who has been a very vocal advocate for furloughs, which is the opportunity um, for inmates to be released from prison for a few hours to spend time with their families, or some of them choose to volunteer, but to sort of be reintegrated into the community and to practice being a part of society for a brief period of time before returning to jail. And I think it's just also important to note that the restrictions around life without parole have the potential to loosen a little bit in the state. Um, there is a bill being debated in the legislature right now that would eliminate mandatory life without parole sentences altogether. Even like the state's highest court um, is looking at a case that that would also have an impact on, on mandatory life without parole sentences for young adults. And so I think it's just important for people to realize that the importance of reintegration and the importance of rehabilitation and preparing people to be a part of community is something that they're very well could be like a universal need for in the months and years ahead. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I wonder, Ivy, you know, there's a lot of stigma around incarceration. And, you know, I listened to the project and you said you went in with some biases yourself, right? What did you learn from doing this project? I think I was going into this expecting to find women who, for whatever reason, were just willing to really overlook the severity of defense or overlook all that comes along with it. But each of these women had their own moment of reckoning, of being like, am I really about to do this? I had a lot of respect and admiration for their relationships because of how honest each partner was with the other. And honestly, because of the circumstances, um, it almost forced a level of honesty that you don't always see in relationships on the mm-hmm. outside. The clear sightedness with which a lot of both partners on the inside and on the outside approach the relationship. Yeah. You know, what I appreciate about your reporting and, and similar reporting is that it reminds us that even though folks are incarcerated, you know, they're still human beings. What do you want people to take away from the series, if not that? The goal, I think, that nearly everyone agrees on is that we don't want people reoffending. Like, nobody mm-hmm. wants another murder. Nobody wants another homicide. And I think that for a long time, the approach has been that the punitive model is how you deter that. And I mean, I could go on and on about what the research says. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that what I will say is, is for people who are incarcerated, you do not want to release them back into the world. And the only thing that they know how to do is commit another crime. Like you want them to have that support. You want them to have those resources. And so I guess the thing that I would want people to take away is that it is not a bad thing for people in prison to have relationships. Like it is not a bad thing for them to be romantically involved. And in fact, like as we talked about, like healthy relationships, sustained relationships can only serve them, and that will in turn serve our communities. Mm-hmm. With that, I want to say thank you so much for coming through to The Common and sharing your work with us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. That was Boston Globe criminal justice reporter Ivy Scott. You can go to wherever you listen to podcasts and search Love Letters to find her three-part series, We Found Love. You can also check out her print piece at bostonglobe.com. And that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening to The Common. If you want to get in touch with us, hit us up on Instagram at WBURTheCommon or send us an email at thecommon at WBUR.org. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and I will talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>